Volume 2 of Diluting Al Wala Wal Bara, part of the Right Belief series, the Unveiled Trilogy, written by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. This book will focus on awakening the faith in a non faith centered world. Explained, broken down, and brought to you unlike before by Ustada Leila Nashiba. Join us Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on Sunna Followers. I want to welcome everybody to the first class for today, which is Thursday. And this is our Aqidah class, our 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Aqidah, Aqidah, Aqidah class, which is the most important class that I teach here. Why? Because this is the knowledge that if you are not implementing in your personal lives, this is the knowledge of Islam that every Muslim is supposed to know. And if you are not implementing what I am teaching in this class in your lives, then all your good deeds are in vain. And that's something very important, it's something very scary. Uh, you don't want to be the bankrupt person. And uh, I had a student um, ask me today, uh, Sister Layla, what's the bankrupt man? Uh, the bankrupt man uh, or the bankrupt woman. The bankrupt man or woman is the person who will stand before, before a law on the day of judgment, as we all will, okay? When our book of deeds are brought forward and weighed on the scale, the bankrupt woman or the bankrupt man is the person that lived their life in this world doing a lot of good deeds. But none of those deeds matter because that person's belief system was not correct. Or that person will have to take all their good deeds and give them away to the people that they hurt in this world. So that's a scary hadith, the bankrupt person. All my prayers, all my fasting, my dawa the people I've helped, the charity I've given, the good deeds I've done when I fed the plants and fed the birds and the ducks and the bees. None of that's gonna be of any uh, help for me. I'll be dragged by my face and thrown into the hellfire. And why does the law drag us by our face? This is another question that one of the new sisters asked me. Uh, she said, Sister Layla, why is it that some of the hadith uh, mention how Allah will have that person dragged by their face and thrown into hell. If Allah is going to have you dragged by your face, that's the sign of, of his disgust. That's the ultimate humiliation to be dragged by the angel, the angels to grab you and drag you with your face bumping on the ground to throw you in that hell fire. That's the ultimate humiliation. That means that you've totally disgusted Allah. Allah won't look at you. Allah won't speak to you. He'll just have the angels drag you by your face into the hellfire. That's a horrific punishment. So we need to think about uh, these hadiths more. Because the more we think about those hadiths, you know, it's supposed to increase your fear of Allah. Because remember, if you don't have fear of Allah, that lack of fear is what causes us to deliberately, intentionally disobey him. People that don't wear hijab, those women out there who refuse to wear hijab, 
They already know it's an obligation. They know it, but they don't care. These women have no fear of a law. Those brothers out there who refuse to grow the beard and also you brothers who keep shaving and trimming your beard. It's a lot of you. You know it's haram to shave and trim your beard, but you do it anyway. Why? Because you have no fear of a law. So, you know, whenever we lack fear of a law, this is what causes us to disobey him deliberately, intentionally. And these are the people that will be dragged by their faces into the hellfire because Allah hates that. He hates for you to outright defy him, to publicly outright defy him, okay? So we need to ponder those hadiths more. They'll help to, inshallah, increase our uh, faith and also bring us closer to Allah. Okay, for this class, I hope everybody has uh, has the book. I did post up last night uh, on uh, YouTube and Facebook pages uh, 18 through 21 of Diluting Wella Welbera Volume 2. We are in the second volume of this series of allegiance and disassociation. And again, the first part of this book focuses on recapping or reviewing what we went over in the first book, okay? And yesterday we spoke about, you know, we recapped the meaning of allegiance and disassociation and what they entail. On pages 19 of the book, and everyone should take their book out right now because we're going to get started. And I want you to turn to page 19, okay? And I want to remind everyone as I put the PowerPoints, <laughs> as I put the PowerPoint up on the screen, I want to remind everyone to please take screenshots with your cell phone or your iPad or your Android or your tablet, whatever you're using, uh, your computer, a laptop, take a screenshot of the PowerPoint so at the end of the class, you can print it out and then you can uh, uh, staple them together and you have a little booklet of today's lecture, the explanation of the book. And then what you can do is take a paper clip and clip that stapled copy to page 19 of the book. So that way you can review 19 through uh, 21 again with your kids and yourself. So let me take everything down so everyone can see. And before I get started, let me talk about this for a minute too, because I always forget. Guys, I just checked, um, and I hope you guys are listening on YouTube, on our Facebook, uh, Zoom channel too. I apologize, I didn't get no sleep, so I'm kind of dizzy. Um, I checked our bank account. We are a hundred and $25 overdrawn, overdrawn. You know why? Because stream, what's this? The streaming program went through and we didn't have that streaming program is $300. And we only, we only had 200 and something in our account. So please guys, we are desperately in need of donations to get us out of that overdrawn. We are 120 something dollars overdrawn. Please donate guys, we need your donations. For those of you who did donate, may Allah bless you because your donation paid the 200 part, but it's, we were overdrawn because not only did the, uh, the streaming program come out, but also I remember I told you guys, Vizard, which is another program we use and also another program we the programs that we use to make the videos came out too and then we got a couple of more get uh, bills getting ready to come out because i got the bills divided where half come out in the beginning of the month 
the other half come out in the middle, then the last part come out at the end. Cause I know we, since we are a nonprofit, that's how the IRS told me to do it. So that way, you know, I don't be bouncing like I just did. So please guys, uh, and I can't make, I usually make the difference up when we bounce from my checking account, my personal money, but I can't because I have to pay my personal bills too. So we need your donation. So uh, please uh, uh, support us by donating at soon. Go to soonerfollowers.net, click on the tab that says make a donation. Okay, with that said, let me put everything down so we can, uh, when I put the PowerPoint up, you can see the whole thing and you can also um, screenshot. So let's see, let me take this down. Is it okay? Yeah, that came down. And I'm going to make myself big screen. And for the people in Zoom, I'm going to share you all to YouTube again. Okay. And do I have moderators inside the room? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Take care of Geechee. You know, she's on I the do. mic all day long. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay. That's okay. What is this? This is Twitch, right? Uh, this is Twitter. Okay. So now if everybody else, let me switch us to, uh, wait a minute. Let me put my snow on. I usually have the snow or something in the background. So when I do this, it won't be a black screen. There it is. Okay. Give me a second. And I'm going to switch now to the PowerPoint. Okay, everybody can see this inshallah. Let me go big screen. And let me take it now to PowerPoint. Okay, let's put it on. And there will be a quiz. There will be a quiz at the end of tonight's uh, lecture. So, whoo, there it is. Pay attention. So yesterday we recapped the meaning of while I will better and what it entails. <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies. <coughs> Today, what we're gonna do is recap the psychology of El Barra. And remember El Barra, El Barra refers to disassociation. Disassociation from any and everything that opposes our belief system. Any and everything that opposes what Allah says, that opposes what the prophet said. Anything that opposes our lifestyle, our morality. And so we're going to recap what we discussed in the first book. And by the way, this is a picture of the second book. And for those of you who have not bought it, you need to go to Amazon.com and get volume. This is a volume two of diluting El while I will better. It's the red one and it's 1999 by Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid. Okay. So we're going to be discussing pages uh really 19 through 21. Okay? So let's take a look at this recap. We investigated the concept of of disassociation and we talked about how El Barra refers to disassociating and, or renouncing anything that opposes the Islamic values of us. For example, uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ, this, uh, this opposes our Islamic values, so we renounce it. We have nothing to do with that. That doesn't mean that we're going to go around hurting people who are who choose to live that lifestyle. We're not going to hurt them. But what that means is we won't take any parts in it. We're not going to go to their gatherings. We're not going to interact with them. And we're not going to speak for them or any of that. 
because it totally contradicts our Islamic values. The same with drugs, the same with alcohol. We're not gonna get involved in that and we're gonna disassociate from anyone who abuses or uses uh, drugs, alcohol. And again, this in also includes holidays. We're not going to take part in any uh, of the non-Muslim celebrations, including birthdays. We're not going to wish people happy birthday because wishing you happy birthday totally opposes our Islamic values of only worshiping Allah. So we spoke about that in great detail and we highlighted the psychological processes required to thoroughly understand the Islamic concepts. We talked about how uh, we have to be less emotional. We talked about how this nation, we're lazy. The prophet said we were. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this nation is more lazy than others. And we're simple minded. We have to, we, we operate off of emotion more so than inte intellect. So we're going to have to stop being so emotional and instead use critical thinking and also use moral decision making. What does that mean? That means when we make decisions for ourselves, they have to be in sync with Islamic morality, not American morality. Does everybody understand? Okay. We talked about how for those Muslims who are able to do these things that we just said, El Bera will build strong relationships amongst, the, uh, amongst us. We'll become more, more together. We'll have more respect for one another. And we'll become closer to Allah. We also talked about if we can uphold these principles of El Bara, it will help the community, the Muslim community to grow because we'll be emphasizing our values, our morality and not the non-Muslims. And we talked about how unfortunately many Muslims fall guilty of implementing disassociation in their lives. And we talked about some of the reasons why. And number one is because they're ignorant. We don't learn a deen. This is something that I'm always emphasizing to you sisters. I am always telling you sisters, stop blaming your husbands. Stop blaming your husbands as to why you don't know your religion. Because seeking knowledge is an obligation upon all Muslims, male and female. You are supposed to seek the knowledge. You are at home all day. You have the internet right there at your hands, your fingertips. Instead of you listening to nonsense, you should have been learning from the true people of knowledge, the mandatory things like how to pray, how to dress properly, what your wifely duties are, what your motherly duties are. What are your obligations to Allah? What are your obligations to the prophet? You should have been learning this stuff. So the number one reason as to how uh, we fail when it comes to El Barra is, is the fact that we ignore mandatory knowledge and we don't even seek it out. Also another reason as to how we fall guilty of implementing El Barra in our lives is, we just can't stop falling into sin. Too many of us put our personal likes and our personal desires over a law. We don't have that fear. We don't fear a law as we should. So this is why you can leave the house without a hijab on and not care. And also we have no respect for Islamic norms. We don't respect the law's laws. 
We don't respect what the prophet said. You ask me a question, I give you the answer and tell you what the prophet said as the answer. Then you're gonna ask me, well, what do the sheikh say? What sheikh? Can't no sheikh out think the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So total disrespect. And we also discussed uh, how um, lack of community support how that also contributes to how we fall short in our obligations uh, or, and, and that entail well, I well better. Instead of us helping each other, we're helping the Kafirs. We rather give our zakat to the um, uh, 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 St. Luke's Hospital for Children. We were to give our zakat to Mother Teresa's orphanage instead of giving our zakat to the Muslims in our community who are in need of it. Okay, so this is another reason as to how we fall, get, fall guilty. Also, we ignore the symbols of Allah, meaning the masjid. Look at the masjids, they're empty. We have a terrible war going on in the world. And instead of the, the masjids being filled, they're empty. But we out in the streets protesting. We all on TV protesting. But we, when we should be in the masjid, praying. So disdain for the symbols of Allah and not caring about what happens to other believers, all of these things contribute as to how many of all us fall guilty of violating the concept of allegiance and disassociation. We need to emphasize the need to correct this. And the way to correct this is by number one, seeking the knowledge. Number two, carrying out our obligations, whether you like it or not. And number three, by embodying Islamic ideals, then helping each other in the community. And we also spoke about the difference between showing compassion and showing empathy and showing sympathy. We talked about that. As Muslims, we're supposed to be compassionate of others. Muslim and non-Muslim. We're supposed to be compassionate even towards the animals and Allah's earth. But that don't mean the same as sympathizing. We don't sympathize with anyone except the believers. So we don't sympathize, but instead we will empathize for you. We will empathize with you. Big difference. And we talked about that in several classes. And we also discuss how if we deepen uh, uh, our practice of these things that I just mentioned here, you know, this was guaranteed to bring us closer to Allah, closer to each other, and it will cause us to have love for our way of life instead of hating it. Too many Muslims hate Islam. We're so quick to say that I hate the hijab. I hate my beard. I was listening to some famous speaker, a stock for law, speak about how much he hates his beard. That's not a statement that a diet should be saying. You don't sit there and tell the people that you hate your beard and you can't wait till you go to heaven because you think that you won't have one there. You're crazy. You're going to always have a beard if you're a man. The beard is what's distinguishes the male from the female, okay? But for a diet to say that you hate something that Allah loves, that's not cool. So we have to train ourselves to love what Allah loves and only hate what he hates. This is how we develop allegiance and disassociation. And we also... Uh, stress the importance of being a unified nation, a nation of solidarity. We use the companions as our example. They were from different tribes, 
and the Arabs were a warrior race of people, as you guys can see in the stories of the, the Sahaba that me and Mukhtar are doing. But even though they were from different tribes and they were enemies before, Allah brought them together and they became one nation. They became brothers and sisters in faith. And they began to care and want for their brother what they would care and want for themselves. That's the approach that the companions touch and that's the approach we should take in dealing with each other. And we talked about this. We talked about how we should encourage unity, justice, righteousness within and outside the Islamic community, whatever communities we belong to. And then I gave examples and uh, Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid gave examples from the companions. For example, he, uh, we talked about Bilal already, Allahu Anha, and how Abdullah ibn Himar, he had to battle against a drug addiction. He was addicted to alcohol. That was a battle for him. But the prophet let the people know, don't call him a kafir. Don't call him a kafir because he loves Allah and he loves me, the prophet. He ain't no kafir, but he's a sinful person. Okay, and we try to help our brothers and sisters when they, we find them doing sins like that. Try to get them help. And we also use examples from of Umar, ready Allahu Anha, how he was a stickler for justice. And we use the example of Amir Ibn al As when he came and asked Aisha, the uh, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, 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 how did the Prophet pray? And she said he would pray all at night till his feet swollen. And Amir el said, well, I'm going to pray and never stop praying. And I'm going to fast and never break my fast. And, and I'm going to uh, never get married. So we talked about how that's not justice to ourselves. Islam is a way of life based on balance and dignity. So these are some of the things that we discussed in the first chapter, you know, of that book. And we concluded our discussions by emphasizing the importance of taking all this knowledge that you're learning here and applying it, acting on it. We talked about how the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, faith is in the heart of the person. And whatever is in your heart will show itself through your limbs, your actions. So the believer will live his life, live her life, doing the deeds that are easy for them that bring about the love of Allah. They do the deeds that will take them to paradise and they end up there. Whereas on the other hand, the hypocrites and unbelievers, they ignore Allah's commands and they do the deeds that's gonna take them to the hellfire. So we talked about that. All of that was covered in the first chapter of the first book. So now let me give you a quiz and the quiz is only two, and two questions. Inshallah. Which of the following things are reasons as to why people fall short in their implementation of El Bera? What about the first one? Ignorance of the Dean. Is this one of the reasons why people fall short in implementing disassociation in their life? Yes or no? What do y'all think? Yes. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Welcome back, Fresno. Good job. I'm sitting here calling her name. She ain't even been here. You know, I look stupid. Good job. Exactly. This is the number one reason. What about this one? Sinfulness, committing sins. Is that a reason as to why people fail to implement disassociation in their lives as Muslims? Is that what reason? Yes. Mashallah. Yes, it is. 
Why is it? Who can explain why sinfulness? Who was the brother? Let me hear from that brother. We don't hear the brother's answer that often. For the brother, can you explain why or how, what effect does sinfulness have on our faith? What causes the sins we commit to take us away from Allah and away from obeying him when it comes to our allegiance and disassociation? Let's hear it. Let's hear you explain it. It's just that over time, as you like commit sins, you get so used to it that it's like, um, so as you like keep committing sins, right? At some point, it's going to be difficult to, it's kind of hard to explain. Okay. I see where he's going. Anybody want to help him out there? Anybody else? Yeah, if you keep on doing something over and over again, you think it's right and you believe in you doing right. So when something comes in that contradicts that, you fight that. Exactly. That's it. You know, a person gets comfortable. You know, that's why the prophet said whenever we commit a sin, a black stain comes on your heart. Because you got comfortable with it. When you first do the sin, you might be feel guilty. You might think, uh-oh, Allah getting ready to send a lightning bolt. So you might sit around like, uh-oh, waiting on it. Then as the day goes on, you see there ain't no, no lightning bolt hits you. You start to relax. Then as two days go by and you see nothing happen to you, you'll be like, uh-oh, let me try it again then. And then we'll keep sinning again and again, getting away with it, thinking that, okay, uh, Allah don't see me or Allah ain't going to do nothing to me. So, mashallah, you know, we get comfortable in our sin and, and we start off with minor sins with, and we end up working our way up to major sins. Good job. What about this one? No respect for Islamic values. Is that one of the reasons as to why people fall short in implementing uh, allegiance and disassociation in their lives as Muslims? Yes. Exactly. Give me an example. Give me an example of how people fall short in their Islamic values. They have no respect for the values. Give me an example. Who can give us an example of how a person show has will show no respect for Islamic values? You guys can't think of anything. One is uh, the way we dress is our Islamic values. Mashallah, look at how you sisters are dressing. How many of you sisters got on uh, straight leg blue jeans or tight fitting blue jeans? I doubt very seriously that many of you are wearing elephant pants. Sisters got on uh, straight leg blue jeans. Pants are not haram. It's lawful to wear pants, but they have to be harem pants. They cannot, they got to be elephant. Like uh, the pants Jamila Pasha sells, palazzos. They can't be pants that show the shape of your leg that fit close and tight to you. Okay, for you sisters that dress that way, you're showing no respect for our values. I tell you guys all the time, makeup is not haram. There's nothing, I repeat, there is nothing. I repeat again, there is nothing in the Quran or the Hadith or from any of the companions saying that makeup is haram. In fact, they all said it's lawful, except for Ibn Masood, Aisha, Ibn Umar, Ibn, Ibn Abbas, Sa'id al-Kudri, Azubair, Telhat, Umar, Abu Bakr, then none of them say that makeup is haram. They all said that a woman can show her makeup. But so y'all focus on the wrong stuff. Y'all focus on makeup when you need to be focusing on your clothing. Ain't nothing wrong with wearing makeup as long as you ain't looking like a prostitute. 
If you put on makeup and look like a prostitute, that's a different scenario. But if you wear makeup with dignity and class like the prophet's wives did because they all wore makeup too. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But look at those pants you sisters are wearing. Y'all wearing straight leg pants. Look at those shirts y'all wearing with belts around your waist. How many of you Somalis are running around with those abayas on that's got belts, waistbands? That's haram. We don't wear waistbands and belts. No, you ain't on nobody's battlefield. Who you think you are? Nicki Minaj wanna be? Okay. So again, that's an example of no respect for the value of modesty. As Muslim women, you know, we're supposed to be modest. And the same goes for you brothers. How many of you brothers wear those tight fitting blue jeans and you tuck your shirt in your pants? Hello, some of you brothers take the shirt down a little bit further and try to puff it up. Hello, puff it up. So you brothers are not free of this either. Y'all focus on women. Look at how you brothers are dressing, especially when y'all going around the cab for women at the job, tucking in them shirts, wearing them, uh, them little gay bladed, uh, what they call them pants? Uh, I forgot. Oh, I used to have to, oh, I used to, what is it? Skinny jeans? Yeah, skinny jeans. What's up with you in them skinny jeans? So you brothers got to get it together too. Tucking them shirts in. Hello. So no respect for Islamic values. This is a good reason as to uh, why we fall short in implementing El Berra and Wella in our uh, uh, lives. What about this one? Misplaced love. Is this a reason as to why people fall short in allegiance and disassociation? Misplaced love? What do y'all think about that one? Yes. Give me an example of misplaced love. Misplaced love is, is having your, um spouse you doing everything for them and they tell you to like you have so much love for them and don't have any love for Allah that they can overrule something that Allah says good job that's a lot of that going on here my sister's in um what's that country again South Africa is that what that's South Africa they are right yeah Cape Cod what is it called Cape Cod <laughs> Cape Town, my South Africa, South South African sisters, you know, misplaced love. You're gonna sit there and obey your husband and doing haram things that you know you ain't supposed to be doing. Most things are lawful. A law detailed what's unlawful. He didn't forget nothing and leave nothing out when it comes to sexual relations. Y'all ask the wrong questions. Nowhere does Allah forbid masturbation. Masturbation is good and clean. It's good and clean. It's good and clean because Allah didn't make it haram. Neither did the prophet. And yes, the companion spoke about it. They all said the same thing too. Ain't nothing wrong with it. But what y'all need to understand what is haram is that backdoor action. That ain't no stuff that you sisters claim your husband's forcing you to do. He ain't forcing you. You're doing it because you want to. See, we, we put the attention on things that are not of value because we're trying to cover up the things that are of value that we are doing. So you sisters down there in Cape Cod, wherever it's called Cape Town, Town Cape, South Africa. Y'all better stop blaming your husbands for your misplaced love. A law first, then the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa and then yourself. 
Your husband's further down. Okay? Anytime anyone, your mother, your, your father, your husband, your wife, your imam, anybody tells you to do something that contradicts what Allah says, you don't obey them in that. No obedience to the creation over the creator. And that hadith about a raisin head ain't got nothing to do with this, sisters. Tell your husbands they better learn the deen and stop lying on the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That hadith about obey your leader, even if he had a, a head like a raisin, that ain't got nothing to do with you forcing your wife or doing that backdoor action with your wife. That's how twisted these brothers are down there. I don't know what's going on down there in South Africa, South America, wherever, Cape Cod. It ain't the Kennedys. But y'all better get it together and stop playing it with the dean. Stop twisting those hadiths around and lying on the law, lying on the prophet. The prophet, sallallahu who alayhi wa sallam, said anyone who lies on him will take their seat in hell. That's authentic. And I did not misinterpret it. So y'all get that love together. All right. What about this? Extreme hate. Is extreme hate or misplaced hate, is this a reason as to why people uh, fall short in implementing allegiance and disassociation? Misplaced hate, in other words. Is yes, that a reason? It can be. Yes, okay. it can be one of the reasons. Okay, give me an example. For example, you can hate somebody so much that you can't grasp the limits of Allah by doing wrong, it's committing sins. And the more you commit sins, the more it becomes natural to you to the point that you hate the Good job. Exactly, guys. Well, sometimes we can hate somebody so much that we transgress the limits of Allah, like a lot of these brothers are doing. You hate what's going on over there in Palestine so much that you're going to go and start tearing down people's Starbucks. Too stupid to understand that, that, that you hurting them. They ain't got nothing to do with no people over there. You hurting that man, that Muslim man who owns that store. By the way, that man was on TV again today. Did y'all see it? The one in New York, the, uh, the man from Syria, uh, whose uh, Starbucks was tore down, you know, <laughs> oh man, he, him and his wife and his, his little four children, he had two sons and two daughters and they, they interviewed him asking him, you know, he said the, the, the community came to help him. So hum did he lie? I bet you it was Imam Siraj's community. He said the community came to help him. They, he, they helped him put his store back together and him and his wife and children trying to recover from when those people came, those Muslims came and tore down his store, his busted his windows out. Whatever the mosque is there, may Allah bless the Muslims for showing well, I, well better. And I'm pretty sure they heard my lecture because I sure talked about it enough I heard my lecture went viral about that. So may Allah bless the community in New York that whoever communities it was that went to help that, that Muslim family whose Starbucks was torn because some idiot don't know that Starbucks is a franchise. It ain't got nothing to do with Israel. Just idiots. Okay, extreme hate. That's an example of that. Okay, next question. This is the last question. We talked about how faith consists of what two things? Let me let me explain this better. I mean, and better because I, I don't like the way I got this worded. I haven't had any sleep in a couple of days, so I'm kind of wheezy here. If a person has faith, if you truly believe in Allah, How does 
is this show? You, I'm trying not to give the answer away. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? Faith consists of what two things working together. That's the good way. You can. Okay, say it again. I can't hear whoever that was. Say it again. My heart in the limb. Like uh, whatever is in your heart, we show in your action. Exactly. The heart and the limbs. Whatever is in your heart will manifest itself through your actions. So when you come upon uh, those crazy Muslims, and I'm talking about, well, you know the ones I'm talking about. Wait a minute. Let me put this down. Uh oh, I can't see what happened to Layla. Layla done disappeared. Give me a second. Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Boy, when you're sleepy, you can't do nothing. You know, you will come upon those sisters um, who will say, you will go to a sister uh, and you will say, oh, assalamu alaikum, sister, how are you? You know, it's so nice to, uh, to see you at, here today at the mosque, but um, you look so beautiful. But I want to remind you, sweetie, when you come to the mosque, you know, you sh you know, you should have a hijab on. You know, you want to wear a hijab. You know, this is the, the house of Allah. And they say, don't you tell me how to dress. You don't know what's in my heart. My hijab is in my heart. That's what they say. You know, you only Allah knows what's in my heart. My hijab is in my heart. You know, when you hear a Muslim react that way, I want you guys to remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and you tell the person this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whatever is in the heart will manifest itself through your actions. So you tell the person, yes, you are correct. I don't know what's in your heart, but looking at your actions, I can tell that you have a problem with hijab because you need to put one on. Wearing a hijab is an obligation. Whatever is in the heart is going to show itself through your actions. I can tell how strong you are just by how you, you the choices you make in life, how you're living your life. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us, commanded us. He commanded us to judge each other by the actions, not the heart, because we don't know what's in there. But I'm supposed to judge you from your actions because the Prophet taught us to be careful who we associate with. Be careful who we choose to allow to get close to us because a person takes on the character and the religion of their close friends. Association brings about assimilation. So we're supposed to judge each other's actions. That's all we can judge. You know, so I want y'all to, to, when those people come at you and say, you don't know what's in my heart, tell them I'm not talking about your heart. I didn't say I knew what was in your heart. I'm just telling you that your actions are wrong right here. Sister, you got to put a hijab on. I had a phone call uh, this morning. It was kind of weird because I usually don't take calls from um numbers i don't know but some person called and i just answered the phone not thinking and it was a brother a brother said that uh he lived in new york he said sister layla a sister came to the mosque he said um she was not dressed properly he said so i happened to be there when she came in he says she was not dressed properly at all. He said, I said, I said, cold as it is. He said, cold as it is. 
He said, so I told her she had to leave. She told me, you can't throw me out of the house of Allah. He said, as soon as she said that, another brother came and said, either you leave or I will pick you up and physically throw you out. So, <laughs> so she left. So the brother said, so I just wanted to know, can we throw him out? Yes. The prophet Muhammad wouldn't have put up with that. Do you know how many people the prophet threw out the mosque? Do you think the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would allow some woman to come into the mosque looking like a strumpet? Do you think that? Do you know the prophet would have people put out the mosque if they came to the mosque smelling like onions? If they came to the mosque smelling like garlic? If they came to the mosque with their hair all over their hair, he would tell them, go home, clean yourself up. And don't even ask me about Umar. Umar stopped the women from coming completely to the mosque. So yes, this is, I don't know where, uh, this is another example as to how we try to mix Christianity with Islam. You know, we transgress the boundaries of while I were better. You know, this, the Christians tell you that this is the house of the God, of the Lord and we can't throw you out. That's maybe Christianity. That ain't Islam. Oh, yes, you can. And you can physically, like that brother told him, I said, you can physically pick her up and throw her out. Seriously. I don't know where these Muslims get this understanding. Y'all better learn the religion. You better learn them hadiths. You better learn this deen. Oh, yeah. The prophet did. He tell you, get up and get out of here. Get out of here with that onion. Get out of here with that garlic. Who is this man with his hair over his head, knotted up, looking like a shaitan? With his beard, not, he would go home, go clean yourself up. So that's a misconception that you Western Muslims have that can't nobody throw you out the mosque. Oh, yes, they can. Come to my mosque looking like a strumpet and see what's going to happen. You ain't got to worry about the brother stopping you. We will stop you at the door. We sisters. Oh, yeah. We'll tell you nicely. Give us a problem. We'll pick you up too. Toss them to the curb. Keep it moving. Yes. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. So I'm going to stop right here.